Welcome, foolish mortals, to the Haunted Podcast. I am your host, or your ghost host. <laughs> our tour begins here, in this intro to our show. Here where you hear some rumblings of our co-hosts as they appeared in their corruptible mortal state. Kindly step all the way in, please, and make room for everyone. There's no turning back now. Your cadaverous parlor betrays an aura of foreboding, almost as though you sense a disquieting metamorphosis. Is this 80s horror movie podcast actually starting? Or is it your imagination? Hmm? And consider this dismaying observation. This podcast had no windows and no doors, which offers you this chilling challenge to find a way out. <laughs> of course, there's always my way. <laughs> Greetings, Starfighter. You are about to listen to the totally super awesome 80s reboot overdrive podcast. Always remember, no matter where you go, there you are. Ready, player one. Darkness falls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. Creatures crawl in search of blood to terrorize your neighborhood. And whosoever shall be found without a soul for getting down must stand and face the hounds of hell and rot inside a corpse's shell (laughs) the foulest stench is in the air the funk of 40,000 years and grisly ghouls from every tomb are closing in to seal your doom and though you fight to stay alive your body starts to shiver so no, my immortal can resist the evil of the thriller. That was fantastic. That was fantastic. Were you sucking helium, dude? No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty talented. I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> all right, listener. Thanks for joining us. We are on another episode of 80s Reboot Overdrive, and this time we are talking 80s horror movies. On the show today, we have got Chris. Hello. Nick. Hello. <laughs> and Scott. Hello. <laughs> and, and you guys don't know this, but Scott's had a cold a few days, so that's probably the reason why he sounds like that. So <laughs> it's, it's helped it. It's helped out the uh, voice a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're getting started. We're talking about 80s horror movies. I mean, there's so many great movies uh, that we can talk about. As we've done in the past with kind of our movie reviews for the years from, you know, 1981 through 1989, what we've done is we've come up with three movies, three to four or five movies that we want to talk about. So different, you know, our co-hosts are going to kind of have a story to tell or maybe they're picking their favorite you know we'll we'll see as we go along but you know obviously we're close to hollow's eve here in 2015 so it's the actual perfect time to be talking great 80s horror movies uh so we have just probably a lot to cover and scott i know this is kind of your uh you know your idea to do this and I'm actually a little worried because, you know, you had this whole heavy metal thing going along with <laughs> horror movies. I don't know if we have like a psychologist that we can call or something like that. But uh, if you could get us started, that'd be great. You know, it, the 80s had a lot of really, really great horror movies. And there, there's so many of them that are really like kind of B movies, if you think about it. But they, they they kind of fall into different categories. I was thinking about this as I was picking my three. Uh, 
you know, you, you fall into the supernatural horror movies or the slasher horror movies. And there's there's so many slasher horror movies that were just really, really bad. Mm. Um, it's it's kind of fun to, to think about those things, uh, how, how bad they were. I, I, I like watching bad movies. I don't know. <laughs> it, it's just, it's one of my things. Anyway. Uh, Mac and I, Me bad or? No, not oh, not quite oh, Mac and Me. Not quite okay, that okay. bad. <laughs> <laughs> like Condor Man, Dad? Okay. Oh, Condor Man, there you go. We're going to have seven degrees of Mac and me. Every, everything we bring up, we'll be putting back to that one. But please go ahead. I'm, go- I'm going to start with something that you, that you brought up, actually. It's not my like my favorite movie of horror of the 80s, but it was something that always kind of stuck out to me because of my love of heavy metal. And uh, this movie was actually brought up on one of, your, one of the previous podcasts, uh, back for when it was featured in that year and that was trick or treat with uh with skippy or skip skippy from uh growing not growing pains i'm sorry back, uh um well family ties yeah family yeah, ties. Yeah. Family yeah. ties his name is mark um, price i'm sure you wouldn't feel happy being skippy <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you know it was about this kid who was like obsessed with this certain artist, this uh, heavy metal artist who dies in a fire and uh, he possesses a record. He, he, he puts his like evil soul into this record and it's like the one and only and, and a guest star in this movie is uh, Gene Simmons, who's a DJ. And uh, so this kid happens to meet, you know, Skippy meets Gene Simmons and gets this record from, from him. That was the last recorded thing that this uh, I can't remember his name. I gotta look up a, a, the the artist, the the heavy metal guy's name, Sandy Kerr. Kerr. Yeah. Anyway, so he was obsessed with this guy, and he dies in a fire, and this record gets possessed, and and he was always picked on as a kid in high school or something, and so he was trying to get revenge on all his friends. And, this evil spirit helped him and it just got really got bizarre. There's one part where there's a girl in a limo listening to some music and it melts the headphones to her ears because it's part of the possessed, the, the evil spirit getting to her. That is some awesome music. Yeah, right? oh my God. Bad, bad special effects. You know, you got to love that. So, uh, Oh wait, was this the one with Ozzy in it? I don't know if Ozzy was in that one. I, I, wait, I know, I know. Gene Simmons was in it for sure. Yeah, he he was, according to IMDb. Uh, okay, I, I, I remember that one. Thing. Yes, yes. Okay. I yeah, I never saw it either, but I I knew it only because yeah, Ozzy and Gene Simmons were in it. Yeah. I forgot Ozzy. Oh, that's right. He's on the cover of the. I don't even remember him being in it. I wonder what he was doing. I, Wait, according no. to this, he was a pri- he was an anti rock priest. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, and this was this movie came out right around the same time that there was a lot of the uh, the discussion of you know is is heavy metal Satan the so PM, like, you know, the, the PMRC Satanic. episodes yes yeah, like Judas Priest and all that and right that. And, yeah and uh, you know people committing suicide and saying that it had something to do with uh, Black Sabbath or whatever mm-hmm. which is. You know, if you're if you're taking yourself out, you're doing it for a lot more reasons than just listening yeah, to music. Because you know, music. You know, musicians want to kill their fans. You know, just yeah, to... exactly. <laughs> that 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 means repeat business, right? Yeah, I want <laughs> I want you to enjoy life, not end your life. Is oh, nice, <laughs> nice. So uh, that was my first pick. Yeah, actually, IMDb has that listed as a comedy horror music. <laughs> A comedy, comedy horror musical. It does. <laughs> How is it comedy? I did not see any comedy in that at all. I think just the fact that Gene Simmons and Ozzy Osbourne are in it, and Ozzy <laughs> is playing a priest, I think that is just comedy Long by in of itself. Yeah, yeah. And Skippy. Skippy's in it. So Mark Price, I believe his name is, right? Yes. Oh, we'll go with Skippy, though. So. Well, um, yeah, it was brought up, uh, I know, earlier, so that had to be, what, 1986? Um, so yeah, it was in that 1986 uh, movie review. Yeah, and still haven't I, seen I, it. So <laughs> it was either Nick or Tim that brought it up. I think it might have been. It was Tim. I think it was Tim because he yeah. was on uh, with us with the heavy metal, and I could see him that being his. Uh, his yeah. Real house. Yeah, yeah, that was him. Nick, what do you got for your first pick? Uh, first pick 
you know, I haven't, you know, like, I really didn't decide if this was my best pick or not, but I wanted to get it out there before any of you other guys did, because, frankly, it's just that great. Um, the Thing, John Carpenter's The Thing, one of the great claustrophobic horror movies ever. Just some really great special effects to hold up even now. Really great update of, you know, the, you know, original 50s film, and I'll admit I haven't read the original short story, though I heard that was pretty creepy as well. But what do you guys think? It's one of my favorites, actually. You you just stole one from my list because oh, that sorry. Was, no, that's okay. That's all right. It's that good. I mean, Kurt Russell was awesome in it. Mm-hmm. The the special effects were pretty cool, and I I watched that quite a few times back then. And oh, I definitely. absolutely thought it was awesome. It was one of my favorite thriller Jeez. horror movies, uh, ironic a- alien movies, whatever you want to call mm. it. Yeah, it's a great show. Well, and John and John Carpenter being oh, yeah. involved, which which makes for a good horror movie you know, under most circumstances. And Kurt Russell, kind of, I don't remember if that was before or after the uh, Escape from New York movie, but um, I, I know I know uh, that right then he was on a roll with movies. He, he was, I th- thing was eighty two. I think Escape from New York was after. Okay, you could be right. I, I can't remember which one came which one came first. Well, he was he was pretty bad in both of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah he was not bad as in lame, but bad yeah, as in bad, ass. Bad, bad. <laughs> Escape from New York was uh, eighty one. Eighty one. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry, movie fans. <laughs> and then he made uh, big what big trouble in Little China, oh, which is a whole different kind of horror movie. Yeah, actually, I just, that was uh, eighty six. Eighty six. Yeah. But, but, you know, just, just a great movie. You know, even if you've seen it before, just the feeling of paranoia, you know, just stuck in a place with no communication, no way out. Anyone you know could be a shape-shifting, multicellular alien monster. <laughs> and Kurt Russell is pissed at you. And, you know... You... Uh, I gotta say, my favorite scene is when they have the electric electrical... You know, electrical diodes or wires, and they're testing it on the little petri dishes. Of oh, the, the, the heated, the heated wire there. Yeah. yeah, and it and it jumps, jumps and it just freaks out, and and uh, then the, the head uh, of one of the guys that gets killed, Norris. Yeah, yeah he it falls off the table and then just sprouts legs. Yeah, and the best I gotta say, the best line in the movie, and you uh, are, yeah, you you gotta be. Effing kidding, you're kidding me! <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, because yeah, because it shows that yeah, literally no part of whatever you know being is the thing is wasted. A nice little bit of trivia. It's, it's um, we'd actually discussed this. I had taken a horror movie class in college, and this was the first movie we'd seen. And I first time I'd ever seen it. I was like, I think eighteen, and yeah, it was definitely great. But um, I guess the scene where. Now, was it... I'm trying to remember which character... It was Dr. Blair, I think Wilford Brimley's character, when he's trying to do the uh, resuscitation, and oh, yeah. the, the mouth opens up in the chest and, bite, and bites his hand. The, they actually replaced the actor with a, with a real-life double amputee with a, with a rubber mask on. No and way. They, yes, and they, um, they counted on the fact that people would be paying attention to the fact that a giant mouth just opened up and bit a guy's arms off, that the... The, the silly rubber mask for half a second, and, <laughs> and they're true, and it's true. But yeah, he puts both his arms through the chest and yep. chops him off, and he. Oh, yep. that, there's it's a very so, goofy movie. Yeah. So many good scenes in that movie too. Like you're just really enthralled through the whole thing. And I think part of it was this was like you said that starkness of the location, mm-hmm. where there was nobody coming to help at all. It was it was literally whoever was there, and that's it. And mm-hmm. once once those people were overrun, that was it. You mm-hmm. know, there was no cavalry in this movie. There was nowhere to run. There was no car to get into and drive through the woods to get to the highway. I mean, there was that was it. You were there, and yep. you were either going to fight or you were going to die. <laughs> and they, you know, and they never, you know, cleared it up, which I think is a good thing. But there, what I also like, it what adds to the horror for me is the idea that if you're a thing, you don't actually know it until you attack. So, you know, you could be acting completely normal and all of a sudden, Cray! and yeah, there you go. Um, they never said one way or the other, but that's been a theory that I've heard bandied about, that it's so perfect that, like, 
that the creature doesn't even know it's part of the thing until it actually needs to attack. Yeah. So that's that's even creepier to me. Now, have you guys... I've never seen the actual original, the black and white. The thing from Another World? Uh, neither have I. And I've heard it's scary, but considerably less so. I've heard the the thing is less of a versatile creature. Mm. From what I hear, it was very much one of those, you know, like, Shakarama type scare movies that they used to do, like the matinee scares, <clears throat> with, like, you know, guys in weird costumes. I, I heard it still had the kind of creep factor to it, but they, it was very much a product of the 50s. It was. It, it, I, I don't think I've seen the whole movie um, <laughs> of the original, but it was kind of almost a spinoff of the blob. In the oh. way, in the way that the, in the way that the character was almost this, uh, it, it wasn't really a thing. It was like a liquid or something like that, and that oh. became. So it was sort of a spinoff after sort of the Blob, and that kind of same, like I said, like a very fifties genre of of that kind of silly fifties horror movie, which today obviously it's going to make you laugh more than it's going to scare you but exactly. i'm sure i'm sure back then plus like you said the graphics you know 25 or 30 years later with the special effects were you know uh, worlds away from what they yeah. had you know they had gelatin and food coloring <laughs> exactly <pretty> much. <laughs> Now, I'm, Bosco, curious. Syrup, yeah. I, I, I'm very curious to find out if I'm going to get the same reaction I did when we did the 1982 movie review. Oh, God. Um, I still haven't seen it. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, see, I got the oh. same reaction. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you really, it's, it's seriously, you really should see it. This Halloween, it gets some, you know, if you got, if you do horror movies on Halloween, I try to do that occasionally. Uh, not really, no. Um, because oh, I was going to say, if you if you do that, Get get that as one of them because it's just it's really really just yeah super creepy like and not like weird not like you know weird creepy just legitimately unsettling paranoia creepy and, and it's legitimate legitimately well done too it's yeah. not it's not campy in any mean I mean it's no. like it's it's very very well done I mean you got John Carpenter behind it so it's it's definitely something that's uh, you know it's lived up to its name for sure. Yeah. And, like, it's funny, none of us, until right now, what I'm going to say is nobody's mentioned the 2011 version, because nobody <laughs> There's saw There's a it. reason, yeah. <laughs> Nobody watched it. Why would you Why would you go back, you know, and try to watch something that was so well, well done? Well, there's, yeah, there's no reason to, to, to do that. It was, yeah. it's a piece that really stands on its own, should have continued to stand on its own, not to sound like an old curmudgeon, but, but there you go. Well, yeah. it's not like I've been avoiding it. It's just one of those things that just that I haven't had the across. opportunity that yeah. you know came up. Okay, and so you're a fan of aliens, right? Alien movies. Yes, yes, yes. It's an it's an alien movie. That's all it is. It's an alien horror flick. Okay. If Without you look at if you want to look at it from an alien point of view, that's what it is. Well, it's just I've never made the time for it. Is all. Yeah. You know, it's not Definitely. like I'm avoiding it. It's just you know I'm not. You know, sitting around looking on the TV and going, "Oh, yeah, that's right. I should remember to look up the thing." You know, that just doesn't yeah. pop in my brain. So it's Halloween. Definitely <laughs> worth the 110 or 109 minutes to less than two hours. Awesome. Considering the year that it came out, you should get yourself some original uh, Jiffy Pop stovetop uh, popcorn. And <laughs> there you go. There you put go. it over the fire and, and watch that with some Jiffy red Pop. with some grape Kool Aid or something. <laughs> Seriously, knee high. Uh, knee there high. you go. Even better. Even better. <laughs> All right, so we're getting to our next heavy metal slash horror movie fan. So you know, once again, oh, yeah. we need the psychiatrist <clears throat> to get uh, uh, on the horn here. Uh, so, uh, Chris, what do you got for us? Well, I think the the one that tops my list is from. I gosh, I was probably twelve years old, and which is right about the time where you really start being able to watch scary movies late at night. And that was uh, The Howling, which I think was Ooh. 1981, um, which actually started out as a serial killer movie and then turned into the werewolf movie because a news oh. reporter was reporting that there were serial killings happening. Oh, okay. And then when she actually started to investigate, 
that's when she found out this sort of secret society of the werewolves. And, mm-hmm. uh, and that movie just had some incredible special effects, very dimly lit. I don't think there was a bright scene in the entire movie. Everything happened at night or in the forest or in the dark. Um, and it had a little bit of psychological with these werewolf pack that kind of lived separately uh, under the guise of this like life camp. Uh, almost like hippie werewolves in a sense. They lived yeah, very, very secluded, very away, and it was this like life teaching sort of camp that she was taken to. Uh, and then to find out that it was basically surrounded by everyone was a werewolf, and that's how they tried to keep this a secret society yep. until this one werewolf decided that he was going to break off, go into the city, and not follow the rules of the of the organization and start killing people. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's like this, there's a scene in there where it's almost, uh, uh, I don't know how to go this direction, but it's, uh, it's almost where like they all turned at the same time, right? So it's yeah. almost, it's, it's almost um, like sexual in nature. Very it's much like so. Derived. And part of it, yeah, and part of it was that too. Part of that movie was the eroticism of being that, shapeshifter the Mm -hmm. werewolf having so much control over your body and uh it just it just caught me when i first watched it and i like i said i was i was 12 years old i think it was 1981 i'm pretty sure it was 81 82 maybe Mm -hmm. so that was the time when i was 12 that i was able to watch movies later and i think that might have been the first real horror movie i saw Hmm. like at night at home and it never left me like that was, was my favorite horror movie I was gonna say, so, how much sleep did you actually get after <laughs> almost zero probably. almost <laughs> zero <laughs> so, so now why why would werewolves get to be or werewolves are like hippies but yet the vampires like lost boys get to be the pretty boy biker boys hmm. yeah i uh, interesting yeah. that you would you would say that and that almost seems because I think there's a difference between the erotic nature of, of of the werewolf movie compared to the romantic of the vampire. Mm-hmm. Two yeah, completely different types, similar in a way, but very different. The vampire in the tuxedo usually very well dressed, normal. Uh, the werewolf always seems to be the guy who's almost kind of half animal, even when he's not a werewolf. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Right. I was going to say that it's very, like a very primal thing. Right. Like a very primal, you know, exactly. Very primal where the vampire is very almost uptight in a sense. Very rigid, very uptight where the werewolf almost really doesn't hide the fact that he's a werewolf yeah. in some senses. You know, or he's or always that very primal, uh, organic, natural being both in both instances, both ways. Like, I could see Steven Tyler being a werewolf. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Or Lemmy. 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 <laughs> Lemmy actually is uh, a werewolf, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and usually a drunk one, oh, probably. Man. I want yeah, drunk uh, werewolves now. <laughs> I actually, I, there's a friend of mine back in high school uh, who I used to play Dungeons and Dragons with. A guy named uh, Chuck, and it was just hilarious. We were in computer class, and so this had to be ooh, ninth grade, ninth or tenth grade. No, it's tenth grade, and we're in computer class, and he has the whole ha- class convinced that he he believes he turns into a wolf <laughs> when it's the full moon, and so he they're they're eating it all up. You know, he is just just giving it out there and telling this story and he's just making it like it's like he truly believes in it that this is his animal totem and he truly believes that he turns into this wolf and they were just eating it up and i'm sure they all thought oh that weird kid and as we're leaving class together he actually you know he like smiles at me as we're walking to our lockers and he says you think they bought it (laughs) <laughs> I just loved it. It was just awesome. <laughs> now that's what you need the gummy heart for. You need like one of those giant gummy hearts and just take a bite out of it when you <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. 
So we're up to my first pick. I actually watched this movie, oh, geez, two days ago. Because uh, wow. I was actually curious to see if it would hold up. Um, you should have been wa- you should have been watching the thing, but yeah, I will, and, you know, we'll and, and, and exactly, you're right. So uh, going back now, I guess I should have looked for that one. But I found this on demand. I knew it was going to be one of my picks, but I wanted to find out, you know, if it would still hold up from the '80s. Um, and when I first saw this, I remember being, I, I want to say, a lot more impressed by it. But this time around. I don't know. It kind of lost something for me. Uh, but there's a lot of good stuff in it. I'm talking 1985 Fright Night. Ooh. There you oh, go. yeah. Yeah. That's, so, that's a class. That's a that's the 80s classic. Yeah, <laughs> I did it. So, you know, as a kid, loved, you know, Evil Ed. Jerry, who was the vampire, you know, was very kind of creepy and all that. But now the older Dave, who was rewatching this... Jerry Dandridge to me just seemed kind of like an egotistical jerk, you know, and I felt more like he was, you know, more towards a uh, very comparison to Jerry Hathaway from Real Genius. Oh. Yeah, for some reason, I, I, I put that more attributed to him, and I'm thinking, how is he getting the women, you know, and being so, you know, what perceived as ultra cool? But, you know, so my older Dave didn't really believe him as the, you know, suave debonair vampire, you know, but, uh, you know, younger Dave, definitely he bought into it, man. He was all in, (laughs) Um, you know, so Jerry Dandridge was the man. He was believable. He was like the, you know, just in control and kind of scary. But you had Peter Vincent, who is played by Roddy McDowell. And, role. Yeah, yes, and, great and, role. <laughs> yeah, and he did fantastic in it. But watching it now, I realized that Evil Ed was such a jerk to Charlie <laughs> Brewster. And I'm thinking to myself, why did I like this guy? <laughs> but, <laughs> Maybe it was just the name, Evil Ed. That just, that just resonates. But, you know, there's this one scene where he is, you know, they don't show his transformation into the wolf, but he gets. Uh, uh, stabbed by the, uh, the stake, and then all of a sudden he transforms back, and you get to see that transformation, and he's kind of crying out, you know, because he obviously doesn't want to die. But, you know, that was a great transformation scene. So it's kind of reminiscent of American Werewolf in London kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, so, transformation scenes. Yeah, so, so that part was really cool, and it has some really great effects. Um, but, you know, it was kind of like... I don't know. Older Dave didn't buy into it as much as younger Dave. Mm. Um, well, so, but I, it was still a good movie, you uh, know. Like speaking as a kid who, who you know, came of his own more in the '90s in many respects, that was sort of the vampire archetype. You could sort well, you could, it, from earlier that you could sort of blame Anne Rice with the idea of like the suave, cool vampire interview with the vampire that came out, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, and and you know that got, that got popular, you know. I mean, Dracula, the Bela Lugosi Dracula was always very popular as the suave creature, but he was also very monstrous. These were more, I guess, relatable vampires, you know. And also the fact that it was the 80s and apparently being a, you know, coked up douche was, you know, part of the <laughs> course <laughs> personalities. <laughs> and then at the end, you know, I mean, Charlie Brewster and Amy, they just kind of like go on with their lives and even forget the fact that Evil Ed died. <laughs> you know, but, you know, this is my older self looking at, you know, looking back on it now. But, you know, when I was, you know, I, it was 85, so I would have been like 14 or so. You know, I I, I bought into it. I was like, yeah, yeah Fright Night, all in, dude. Awesome. <laughs> yep. I mean, well, who doesn't want to be like, who, especially when you're a teenager, who doesn't want to feel in complete control, you know, with the ability to, you know, bend people to your will and suave and cool without any effort, you know? Right. That's like, that's like teenage fantasy 101, you know? <laughs> yeah, I did. I had a, uh, I, I was thinking about some of the movies that I remember from the 80s, and a, and a bunch of them fell into that same category as seeing them. 25 or 30 years mm. later 
Mm. They just, they were like, okay, wow, this was, <laughs> I don't remember this being this, like, I can't even watch this now. <laughs> it did change. It did change. It's different. It's, you know, 30 years older eyes see it yeah, exactly. a lot differently than they, than they did then. I I have to agree. I mean, what, three o'clock high? Really? Oh, yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It was- yeah, I'll, I'll I'll throw one I'll throw one up here right now that actually is on my list of top three. If you but the movie Prince of Darkness was in 1987, and it had uh, I don't know if any of you remember this one, but it had Donald Pleasance in it, and it was the uh, it was the devil was in a church, and it was encased in this clear glass case of green goo was like supposed to be this aura of the devil and it kind of like mesmerized people and, and like had homeless people on the outside of the church as guards of which Alice Cooper was one of the homeless people, which is <laughs> ironic and funny. <laughs> and any horror movie with Donald Pleasance is, you know, has to be fantastic. Yeah. And it's a John it. Carpenter film also. And, and yeah, and it also had, uh, I, I can't remember what his name might, it might've been John Wang or Wong. And it was like the kind of that one eyed creepy Chinese Victor. guy, Victor Wong. That's it. Oh um, yeah. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I watched that and liter and part of the aspect of the movie was that the devil was in another dimension and he had to get his minions to get him back through this dimension that God had cast him in and to do that you he would go through a mirror like push his finger through a mirror and you could reach in and hopefully somebody could pull him out of where he was cast to and literally for like a week I wouldn't touch a mirror <laughs> like. And you know, I'm six, seventeen, I think, something like that. But now watching it, like literally, like a year ago, and that's how I remembered it. I like, wow, this is really campy, and and kind of goofy. But it's still one of my top three because at mm-hmm. the time, it was also kind of when I was the age that you start thinking about uh, philosophy and religion and spirituality, and it had that sort of that aspect of being in a church and is the devil and God really what we think they are and, and all that. So I think that's kind of what caught me with that movie at that mm-hmm. time was, mm-hmm. was also that very spiritual, like what is my spirituality? And that kind of happened right when that movie came out. So, but yeah, now looking at it 25, 28 years later, it's like, wow, that's, you know, green goo, really. That's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> There's a demonic well, suspension. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, talk about typecasting. Victor Wong, you know, I mean, he played what essentially the same role in Big Trouble in Little China and Golden yeah. Child. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and honest and quite honestly, in, in Prince of Darkness as well. He was like this kind of all seeing sort of guru who knew more than you thought he knew, but wasn't going to tell you until you figured it out for yourself. You know what I mean? That's like every role he ever played. <laughs> and yet every same, movie. At the same time, he's the comic relief, too. Right. And at the same, yeah. uh, well, but he could just stand there and smirk and be comic relief just yeah, exactly. because he, he had that look about him. But yeah. um, and, and probably the best acting job in the movie was done by him. <laughs> Uh, which is funny, uh, and and Alice Cooper never said a word. It was probably the second best actor in that movie. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, is Prince of Darkness is that uh, qualify as your next pick on the list? Yeah, it, it's uh, that's definitely in, in my top three. Just because at that moment it was like it was uh, profound in different ways than just being a horror movie. Very cool. Very cool. All right, so we are going back to Scott. Okay, well. Um, this movie freaked me out, especially one scene. It, it was it's a supernatural. It's it's poltergeist. Uh, oh, got my second choice. Revenge. A real good, a very uh, creepy ghost story. And you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of urban myth about this. You know what happened with these movies with some of the actors. Of this First, movie. yeah. Um. They're here. But, yeah. But the, and, you know, and there's like three, three or four actors that all died within a very short period of time. I know. Within the release of these movies, but, you know, the, the, the first one and then the follow ups. But uh, the, the creepiest scene for me is when the guy tears his own face apart in the mirror in the bathroom. I will never forget 
is, that is the worst. He just starts picking at a little spot on his face, and then next thing you know, he's like tearing his face apart. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, but the chicken has got to be the worst one. Oh, with the maggots crawling yes. all over. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's pretty <laughs> bad too. <laughs> um, you know, and then you have the the. I, I don't know how accurate it is, but they said something about um, when when she was in the pool that was being. I dug heard that up, too. Yep, yep. That uh, these skeletons were actually real, real skeletons. Yeah, yep. real cadavers. I've heard that yeah. too, Jim. Now I I don't know how true that is. I've heard it from several different sources, several different people. So I have never really looked into it as far as uh, googling it or really trying to get to the bottom of it. But there's a lot to it. Uh, the whole the whole thing. Um, the the older daughter, she ends up like dying within the first year of the yeah. Movie. The, well, she had a stalker. The actress did, and uh, who or no no not a stalker, an abusive boyfriend who actually killed oh, her. Oh right. Yep. Yeah, so. Wow. Yeah, and then uh, of course, Carol Ann ends up having some kind of uh, unusual heart condition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is way at a very young age. <clears throat> that movie would have been on my top three because I, I I I like the movie. I love the movie. But there's there's the scene that changed how I view a certain thing, and that's clowns. <laughs> I, oh god! <laughs> oh my god! I, oh, yeah. I okay. hate clowns. Yeah, like not have, not before. just a little bit. Like I despise clowns and the scene with the clown from the rocking chair to the floor to under the bed and uh i'll tell you exactly why because my house when i was that age up north was a corner bedroom it had a window on each side of the uh of the wall on the outside walls and we had a big weeping willow tree in the back and whenever there was storms I could see the lightning, and the tree was so big at that time that it, the wind would force it to like uh, rub against the roof and make similar sounds. So I saw that movie and equated it with my own bedroom. Nice. Did you learn to do the little uh, counting thing? Yes. Oh, yeah. I learned how to count the lightning strikes to see how close the storm would come. One, two, three, four. And then count to four, and it's a mile, I think it is, if you count four seconds between yeah. the lightning and the thunder. And, uh, yeah, and then the clown scene just changed my whole vision of clowns. And to this day, uh, if I if I come near or close to a clown in any aspect, I literally – I freeze up and I have two things, either run or fight. There's no in-between for me with clowns. And that movie did, seriously, and to this day, I <clears> – <throat> I cannot. Uh, I cannot be around clowns. I can't. I. I cannot tolerate clowns. And Poltergeist was yeah. the movie that brought that to life for me. Nice. Even even with, before it got possessed, that damn thing was creepy. The, well, the clown was creepy to begin yeah. with. And yeah, the fur, who, who in the, the hell would have that in their room? Yeah, I didn't. I, yeah, I didn't understand that either. But then, as it became animated, and the lightning in the bedroom was similar with the tree, and uh, just yeah. that movie was shockingly familiar to my own life at that time. And I didn't. I. I enjoyed the movie. I would probably watch it again, but I would definitely fast forward right through the clown scene. You know, I, I got to jump in on the clown thing. A, a few years ago, I did like the evil jester clown thing for Halloween. <laughs> yep. And we went to, uh, you know, uh, a bar up in Chicago area. And I had people literally like th- their face would change when they saw what I was looking what I had dressed up like and they would like turn and walk away from me so mm, yeah. <laughs> it's like they, they couldn't even handle just looking yep. at me because it was just uh, the creepy clown thing it's really bad it's really it's very bizarre yeah and it really does really I, I don't know why 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 are clowns so uh creepy that way but I, that, I, yeah. but I that no scene idea. I'll agree that scene really did freak you out was as far as cons go I mean the, the you know it's one arm with the strike I can picture and the stripes, stripes. The oh, red yeah. and white striped sleeves of this clown wrapping several times around the kid's neck. You know, yep. <laughs> it's, just, it's it's a scene you'll never forget. No, no. So. Seriously, do we have to bring this up now? <laughs> I mean, aren't we all going to go to bed soon? Come on. Yeah, this is why I have gin. <laughs> yeah, right. Lights on. The lights will be on tonight. Yeah. 
<laughs> but no, I wanted to look up something while you guys were talking because I was curious. According to IMDb, quote unquote, the skeletons that emerge from the, the swimming pool while Diane searches for help are actual skeletons. Joe Beth Williams didn't know this until after the scene was shot. So wow. that helps yeah. what we were saying. Yep. Okay. Okay. First, I would have told her while they were shooting the scene. That would have elicited fear. <laughs> uh, I would have. I would have thought that that would have probably. I don't think she could have been too happy about that. No, I would, I, would, I would be pretty pissed off to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard she was. I mean, you heard it through the grapevine that she was like really ticked off that they had kind of done something like that. It kind oh, of needs. It kind of needs to be full contractual disclosure with something like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're gonna be putting you in a pool, and and the skeletons are real. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> now, thanks, yeah, IMDb. Thanks for the again, heads up. According to IMDb again, the production crew used real human skeletons because it was cheaper to purchase them instead God, of plastic of ones. It, nice. Of course it was. So, yeah, yeah of course you got to keep, you know, within budget, of course. <laughs> oh, you so. know, you know, human life is cheaper than plastic skeletons. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> That's a sad commentary. <laughs> <laughs> It is and really the clown nice. puppet used in the film is on display in Planet Hollywood in Caesar's Palace, Las Vegas. So if you guys want to go oh, revisit yeah. that, go I for it. I remember that now. Uh, yeah, well, last time I was in Vegas, we were at Caesar's Palace. I remember <laughs> that. Yeah. Good, pl- good, good place for me to avoid when I exactly. go to Las Sounds Vegas like next it. time. Yeah, very much. <laughs> so, Nick, you're up next. Continuing with the general theme of body horror, I, I chose The Fly, the Cronenberg oh. version. What can be said that isn't painfully obvious when thinking about the fly? I, I love I, that's a great pick, man. <laughs> Gina <laughs> Davis. I think of the yeah. fly. I think immediately of Gina Davis. Oh yeah. Oh oh, Gina Davis, and not you know guys getting you know their hand, hands melted off or you know. <laughs> Yeah, for, for some reason, snap. for for some reason, I go straight to Gina Davis. I don't well, know why. Don't. Okay, your your heart's in the right place. That I think. Because every time I think of the fly, all I think of is the scene where Jeff Goldblum is doing the arm wrestling. Yeah, oh, where he he vomits. A, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's when he's right. doing the arm wrestling, he just snaps the guy's like snaps his off. arm. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was definitely a Cronenberg film. They should have cast him in over the top for that scene. <laughs> 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 he, no, unlike Stallone, he can't bring his lip down to the bottom of his face. So. Well, ironically, most of Stallone's movies weren't horror movies, but they were certainly horrible. So that could qualify. <laughs> but, okay. but yeah, just the the creepy, creepy idea of you know slowly becoming you know this fly monster. You know the perils of testing your science stuff on yourself, graphically portrayed. Yeah. Well, you know, Jeff Goldblum always does such a great job of acting the uh, eccentric scientist, you know. And this was a perfect role for him, I think. He did a really good job of of being that kind of quirky, quirky, I just, I gotta see what's out there. You know, he did it, he did it in a bunch of movies. Well, yeah, I was gonna say, that is, you know, let's just base it here, Jeff Goldblum. Right, I mean, you, you look at him in... Uh, <laughs> you even go back to the big chill. Yeah. And he was uh-huh, uh, he was, uh, he was uh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was the thinker, you know. He had he had the uh that uh deeper mentality of thinking deeper into situations than just seeing what's on the surface. Except right. for Scott, in, except Scott's for on in... probation for being the first co host to bring up the big chill. Oh come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we a don't great talk movie. About, we don't talk about the big chill. <laughs> Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, back up. Why? Why? Why is this off limits? I, I I had not heard this. No, no, I was just kidding. I don't okay, know. good. Okay, because no, actually, I think it was a. Uh, I was. I was no Valley line Girl. from uh, High Fidelity. You're, uh-huh. you're right, though. Yep. It's No Valley Girl, though. Right. <laughs> so. Thanks for bringing that one back up. Yeah. <laughs> now I, I think I heard this in like we were joking. Around. I think they heard this in college. Is that you know that a, the line that Jeff Goldblum says in any movie is important when he repeats it twice. He goes, "Life finds a way." Life. Finds away. Away. Yeah, he always he'll uh, always uh-huh, emph- uh, emphasize yeah. one specific word. And that'd be from word. Jurassic Park. Yeah, that would be. Yes. Oh yeah. But, but you know, Jeff Goldblum, and he, you know, he talks kind of like like you know, he's talking like this, and ah uh, ah uh, ah uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, Every role. Every you've role. got the Jeff Goldblum down. I gotta say, I'm impressed. 
The Jeff Goldblum is akin to speaking like the Christopher Walton. Oh, Walken. Uh, Walken, yeah. yeah. Christopher Walken, yeah. yes. That's, uh, that's... I was looking up to see because I was curious if Valley Girl was actually the one, one of the movies that Nicolas Cage was Nicolas Coppola, but that was when he already <laughs> turned to Nicolas Cage. Yeah, well, uh, just to let you know, in the uh, the past episodes, I got dogged pretty hard for liking Valley Girl, so... Yes, you did. <laughs> yes. See, and I'm on Dave's side on this one. I love Valley Girl. I thought it was a great movie. So, but I digress. Yeah, I, well, actually, I'm curious now. Chris, where are you at with uh, Valley Girl? Pro? Oh, definitely pro. All definitely right, well, pro. there you go. All right. Yeah, I, I, I liked Valley Girl back then. I did. I liked. I, it was a good. It was a. It was a good movie for what it was. You know, <laughs> for what it was. <laughs> but I was Indies also reboot big, overdrive. Like yeah, for I was, sure. <laughs> I was a big. I was a big Fast Times at Ridgemont High fan. So. Yeah, oh yeah, that was go. kind of in the same genre, go. and also had Nicolas Cage slash Coppola. By the way, so there you go. I can't right. speak for everyone else here, but this conversation is surely horrifying me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> yeah, because Nick was on the other one that. Uh, <laughs> was uh, anti-Valley Girl, so... But we've gotten way, way off topic. <laughs> yes, we have. <laughs> Isn't the ha- Halloween's right around the corner, right? Yes. Uh, it's a week from Saturday. Okay. So yeah. does that mean you're going to yeah. dress up as uh, Nick Cage? What? No. Oh, nice. No, I'm going to go as a clown again. Spicoli. No. <laughs> you're <just> Spicoli. <laughs> <laughs> um, go uh, as Nick Cage, and what was that movie where he thought he was a vampire? Or he may have been... Movie that the like cause of the, the the meme face like the Nicolas Cage meme face. I'm not remembering. I let me um keep talking. I'm I'm just gonna we'll we'll cover for other topics. I'm just gonna look at <laughs> well, talk I, amongst I, yourselves. So. <laughs> well, no, I was curious because you did Goldblum. I wanted you to do Walken. Come on, Nick. Uh, you really want me to do Walken? Okay. So, you know, <laughs> what we need is gonna, a little more cowbell. Well, we're gonna yeah. be talking about about horror movies, and we gotta we gotta you know, oh, I'll not stand. really horror, but we gotta yeah. talk about the Dead Zone, I guess. But yep. you know, oh, yeah. you you have you have to have. He, oh, I love how he just accents like one where have. Yep. <laughs> you gotta put emphasis on the wrong. You gotta, yeah, you gotta put an emphasis on the wrong syllable. Wow. <laughs> I got a fever, and yeah. the only cure is more cowbell. <laughs> all right so we should see how many uh we maybe we should have a whole podcast on how many bad <laughs> christopher walken Im- impressions yeah, right. we can do. <laughs> that could take up an hour <laughs> oh yeah uh, oh that was vampire was that vampire's kiss yes oh, yes 1980, 1988 right yep yep and that that the, they they took the one frame of the movie and just of like the wacky ass Nicolas Cage face and made it into a meme. Yep. Wow, I totally. I'm looking that movie up. It's like Maria Conchita Alonso and Jennifer yep. Beals were in that movie. Wow. Wow. Yeah. For the record, that wasn't my sec- That wasn't my uh, third that, choice. That wasn't your third choice. Okay. <laughs> no, I was no. just about to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, the I fly. Mean, the very Cage. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that guy's been around, man. Yeah, Nick has, Nick has gotten around to. And shows. fun and funny how a couple of movies mentioned today are actually remakes of movies from the fifties, mm. The Fly and uh, and the thing. and the Thing. Yeah. And and again, it comes back in the fifties. It was kind of yeah, I guess like The Fly fifties. It was scary for a different reason. You know, you got your head on the body of a fly, and you're stuck in a web, and that's where you get the line, you know, help me, help yeah. me, <laughs> and you know that's. Classic Vincent Price. Too. Yep, you know that. I guess that's that's kind of creepy in a very existential way. But no, this it's like they took what was essentially a pretty silly concept and yeah, yeah. made it into something just utterly foreign, disgusting, horrifying. It was gross. Yeah. It was definitely gross. And like, when he's keeping his parts in the medicine cabinet, ha. Huh. <laughs> and the and it also had it all, also the fly. I do remember the fly for or for the other part too. Is uh, well for two things. Number one, it it was very scientific. Him trying to figure out mm-hmm. what was happening. You know, you can you can almost see his mind working. And at some point, he stopped trying to cure himself when he yep. realized all these things he had going for him now, and just sort of let it be. 
Like, okay, I'm going to take full advantage of everything that this has to offer, no matter what the consequences are. Because I think at some point in the movie, he just thought, I am literally going to live forever, like, and be strong and all this kind of stuff. And he, and you know, speaking of primal creatures, he sort of became this, you know, fly, he became a creature of instinct, and he's very, you know, just kind of skittish and very into survival, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and it also had like one of the quintessential guys that plays a jerk in every role he's ever played. Oh, yeah, which was that guy that was uh, Gina oh, yeah. Davis's like kind of boyfriend or boss. Yeah, well, ex boyfriend boss. Yeah. yeah, and I don't remember the actor's name. I don't, but I just remember that face as just playing a real dirtbag in yeah. every role yeah. he's ever played. He was like the dean in uh, Real Genius, also. It was he. I think so. He was like one of the, or not the dean, like a professor that was like a real jerk. That guy, just every time I see that guy, just think, God, that guy must be a, he's so good at acting like a jerk in the movies, I don't know how he can't be in real life. Like, (laughs) (laughs) The, um, well, what is it? Um, And also, The Fly, and a lot of people don't think about this, because we've just quoted the line, you know, ad nauseum, that's where it came, um, what is it, Uh, be afraid, be very afraid, that that's where that came from. Really? Mm-hmm. I didn't. Oh that, right? yeah, yeah. I think I think it was probably was the first time that that yep. was like a line. Sort yep, of that was a way. line, and, and it's it's become so ubiquitous now we don't even think yeah. about it. You know? Okay, I was wrong. It was not that guy from uh, Real Genius. It's a different guy. Oh. I, I know who. Genius. I know the guy you're talking about. With I'm thinking Real of Genius, the guy. But... I'm thinking of the guy from uh, Ghostbusters also. Ghost, oh, William Ghost... Atherton. Heck. Yeah. Oh yes, yes, yeah, that was yeah. yeah he my did. Okay. He did as well. <laughs> so, so then, who are we talking about now? I don't well, know. The, well, let's look at the. I'm looking it up right now. There's a. Uh, his name is John Getz. Oh yeah. When you know, when you need something, John gets it for you. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Leo, Leo oh, Getz. They call me Leo Getz. You know why? Because I. You know. Oh, and our, just a quick bit of irony. Today is uh, Jeff Goldblum's birthday, so uh, oh, wow. happy, birth- happy 63rd birthday, Jeff. Nice. That's 63. Wow. I know. Oh, my God. Surprised he wasn't in the latest Jurassic Park. It's, it seems to be the only role he wants to play for the rest well, of the I think after, after the Lost World, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I do have a quick question for you because this is something I was talking to Scott before, and he doesn't know the movie, but just looking back through, like, horror movie listings and hundred greatest horror movies of the Mm eighties. The movie Heathers was listed as a horror movie. And I never really, I never really saw that as a horror movie. Uh, A a thriller. Yeah. I I mean, I guess looking at it from a modern standpoint, you know, kids shooting up their school. Yeah. That, pretty horrifying now yeah it is yeah <laughs> I, I mean, not, not to get dark but yeah it's pretty horrifying now yeah it was more of a dark comedy when it came out but that's kind of what i thought too and I, I i went through a bunch of listings i saw it in one and then i looked at four or five more and i'm like it was on these lists and i thought i never really saw heathers. that as a horror movie really yeah heathers oh that's surprising i, I i'm i'm with you on that i i can't imagine it as a horror movie. so i didn't know what you're just uh throwing it out of left field is what your take was as, as far as was is that a horror movie or not because i never really saw it as that i guess and it I, depends on your definition of horror i guess true more yeah, of a, I, I guess yeah. more of a realistic horror i guess if you really wanted to get to it but, hmm. you know just like a socio like christian slater's character is, i mean quite clearly a, a psychopath and so, yeah, I guess it's kind of horrific in that respect. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I thought too on that movie. I just, I it, it's not all... one of my favorites. I I don't I I think I've seen it once way back when because a, a girlfriend wanted to see it in a movie, and you know that's just what you did. But I just it was weird seeing that movie listed as a horror movie because I never ever put it in that category myself. I agree. Well, I think earlier we had classified Ferris Bueller as a sociopath anyway, so. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gonna, when you were talking about movies that you see differently now as an adult, I was going to say, yes, I've said it before, but yeah, when you're a kid, Ferris Bueller is cool and hip and, you know, rebels against the man. When you're an adult, yeah, he ticks a lot of boxes. Yeah. But, but you know, I mean, now looking at it this way, I mean, Heather's, if it's classified as a horror movie, does that mean now Ferris Bueller is a horror movie? Well, there was no murder. There was no murder. 
<laughs> no, Ferris Bueller was just an ass. He's just a yeah. jerk. I don't know. I don't know, but I think Jennifer Grey at the end of Ferris Bueller could have killed someone. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. So we um, to get us have, back on topic. I'm on no my second pick. <laughs> You're um, still. On, we're still on the second pick. We're, well, we. I'm the only one left. Okay. So. Wow. I, I'm keeping score. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so um, where I'm at is uh, – this is actually one I haven't rewatched in a while, but I got a chance to kind of relive the moment because there was another podcast that was done that I didn't get a chance to be on. This was about Stephen King movies. Mm. Ooh, here we go. Mm. And mm. Um, this one was one that I kind of did an email, said make sure you guys talk about this movie. Um, and for some reason, just always loved it from way back when. Um, and what it is, is young boy named Billy, he gets yelled at, slapped by his father, and he gets uh, in trouble because he's reading a horror comic book named yes. Creep Show. Creep Show. Yes. Yeah. yes. Creep Show. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so that's kind of the, you know, what starts and ends the, uh, you know, this movie. And then mm-hmm. between it, you've got uh, short stories of Father's Day. The Lonesome Death of Jordy Verrill, which yep. is the one that I brought up, you know, to make sure that there was a mention of because I just absolutely love Stephen King in that role. Mm. He's just so much so funny of uh, being kind of the <laughs> idiot yeah. you know, that you know destroys his meteorite that he thinks is gonna make him, you know, ultra millions of dollars, but because it's broken now it's only gonna be worth half and all of a sudden it's like growing all awesome. over him. Yeah. Then you've got something to tie you over. You've got Leslie Nelson in there where he's like burying his his wife who's cheating on him with uh, uh, Ted, Danson. Ted Danson. Exactly. Uh-huh. You know, Danson. just yeah. really great stuff. And then you have, you know, The Crate, another great story. Yep. You know, and then you also got the other one where the guy's the locked into his uh, oh. uh, the, the the room where all the bugs start coming out at him. Yeah, ultra creepy, scary stuff. And then they end it with the voodoo doll, with a little boy, you know, now you know, trying to kill his father that slapped him. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. just a fantastic movie. There's really nothing bad about this movie for me, but you know, just you know, I brought it up via email to I think it was Jesse Jackson uh, one of our co-hosts that was co-hosting the Stephen King movies and I wanted to make sure we had a shout out there for Stephen King of the acting job that he did on Creep Show but now I get a chance to expand on that because of yep. my love for this movie so I haven't rewatched it in like I don't know several years but if that sucker was on I'm stopping and I'm watching it yeah well, building off of that, I mean, when you guys were growing up, I mean, I know I loved it, but did you guys ever either watch or read the Tales from the Crypt comics? Because that's definitely it. Creepshow was based off of that type of format. Yeah, you know, I I never really read a lot of comics, but I know I know the the premises of Stephen King's that that storyline was kind of a comic comic book theme and i i I gotta say in the movie i love the transitions Mm -hmm. yes the the comic the comic theme transitions were really really fun to and you know really cool to watch the short story with the with the bugs and that stark white kind of condo that he had with that that was i think that was that was probably my favorite little snippet in creep show that really was, i like yeah. i think the crate was the one that stood out for me the crate was good too but the, i think the bite i think the bug one for whatever reason. i remember that like i mean you have vividly. you have adrian it's barbeau so hard to choose between <laughs> all of those yeah adrian it's, barbeau having yeah. her brains blown out by her husband you know <laughs> in a little you know in a little mental uh escape scene from himself yep you know, because she just won't shut up because she's a drunk and doesn't know how to talk uh, in public <laughs> or something, he just pulls out a gun and blows her brains out of it, like you do. Oh, man. <laughs> but it's like and, and, and hardly ever, anybody ever brings up Father's Day, and Father's Day was such a great one too because oh, yeah. you had the you know the you know the old miser that was kind of you know all his kids were jerks and he all he wanted was his Father's Day cake, but of course he was you know uh, uh, his fortune was you know ill gotten. 
And so, obviously, a jerk in himself, but, you know, at the end there, he's, like, you know, holding one of their heads or something as his mm -hmm. Father's Day cake. I mean, just yep. uber uh, creepy. Yep. So. Uh, Creep Show 2 was not quite as uh, enthralling, but the Creep Show. The well, the raft. Was, the raft. Yeah, the raft. The best, that, well, that, that's where I got mixed up because I, for yeah. I forgot that the raft was in Creep Show 2. Yeah. The raft was the best in my opinion, clearly the best one in Creep Show too. I think that kind of made Creep Show. That was very no. creepy, <laughs> appropriately. <laughs> you know, I, I gotta, I kind of want to mention Stephen King as a, a whole in the '80s. He had a lot of movies that oh that, God. and I was part of that. You were, yeah, you were on I, that I took podcast. Part of, I took yeah. part of that podcast, and it was a lot of fun. Um, Lou is. An amazing. He has so much knowledge about Stephen King. It's really this. It's really uh, fun to listen to him talk about Stephen King and his stories and stuff. And we definitely touched on on this the creep show because it was one of the movies of the '80s that really stood out for Stephen King. And uh, I love the short stories. I love. I love having. Uh, I, I think it's because I have a short attention span. <laughs> Well, that's why I was asking if you got if you grown up you liked the tales in the crypt comics because that's what they were obviously based off of like the, yeah. the no. poster was it like it was made like an EC Comics cover, and yeah they had like the little short horror stories and I always loved those growing up so yeah I did, I did too on a, on HBO I remember oh, watching yep, those show, on HBO yeah. Tales from the Crypt on HBO I think I think I watched them every time they were on I'm pretty sure I've seen every uh, old episode of Tales from the Crypt. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't read the comics, but I did have a magazine. I w I did subscribe to a magazine called FM or Famous Monsters. Oh yeah, yep, yep. yep. Um, yeah. Which I had a I had a drawer full of those things. It's kind of creepy that I had actually had this. If you think about it. And if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, Adrian Barbeau was in every Tales of the Crypt episode that I ever remember being on HBO. <laughs> She had her. She definitely had a fling with the early eighties. Yeah, she did. <laughs> was, like Swamp Thing. And, oh yeah, Swamp. yeah. Right she, swamp. she had a thing for the uh, Crypt Keeper. Before. Yeah, she. Yep. I think she did because she was on every single episode. And, that and, I remember. and, and uh, getting back to what we said about the thing earlier, the only female part was the computer, the chess computer at the very beginning, and apparently that was Adrian Barbo's voice. Really? Yep. See, she's omnipresent. <laughs> oh, that's good. All right. <laughs> Some bit to Adrian Barbeau. The Adrian Barbeau podcast, hour two. <laughs> no, all right. Uh, so, all right. So, uh, next pick is going to Scott. Okay. So, this is number three, right? This is number three. Okay. So, I'm a huge zombie fan. I love zombies, I love the zombie movies. And I gotta go with Return to Living Dead. Oh, that was the John Russo one, right? Not the not the Romero. Yeah, no, it was yeah. the definitely the comic turn. Yep. It was the it was the 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 dark comedy of side of <laughs> of zombies, which I really appreciate. <laughs> I think it's it was a nice turn, you know, something a different little take, and I think it led to uh, to movies like Shaun of the Dead and Zombieland, uh, eventually down the road, you know decade a couple decades later but i think it was like that first step to take it to a funny direction well those Even, movies are the ones that like put the idea in the head that zombies eat brains right not brains just yes they had the half of the you know the old lady she was like half of a lady on a on a table in the <laughs> basement of a morgue and she just kept saying brains and it was just it, it just had a lot of funny scenes to it it was it took everything to a lighter side. It was okay to, to to have fun and watch a zombie movie and not be freaked out by the living dead. So, <laughs> I loved it. They're back from the grave and ready to party. How can you get <laughs> wrong with a tie, uh, with a tagline like like that? No, you can't. <laughs> and I was never really into the zombie. I'm not even like into the Walking Dead stuff that's on now. I, I guess I'd never really been a a, a zombie sort of guy. Have you ever seen Zombie Land? Yes. Okay. Oh, that's funny. I have seen that. I know it's not '80s, but it's just it's still a mention. You hit, if if you if you're not a fan of zombies, if you watch Zombie Land, you got at least 
enjoy that at, for what it is. I mean, it's the only movie that I know of that Bill Murray actually dies in. <laughs> okay. well, well, Zombieland's all about the Twinkies. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, so Return of the Living Dead. Just fun, goofy zombies. It's and so sequel hard. after sequel, too. But... Yeah, oh, it just kept coming. Yeah. Yeah, if I have to get, if uh, I know we're 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 over. So, do you want me to jump in with a number with a number three? Oh, oh yeah, or does it? Okay, um, it probably kind of more mainstream, I guess. Uh, but Hellraiser. Oh yeah, Dude. I really like the original Hellraiser. I thought that that really captivated me, and and honestly, at that point, it had a little bit of heavy metal aspect in it. It had some <laughs> some some hard rock songs, and yeah. certainly the dress of the the Cenobites. Uh, of yeah. uh, the Cenobites was, you know, you could have put that on stage at, you know, ninety uh, percent of heavy metal shows about that time too. So it was, I just liked the movie. I liked the idea, the supernaturalism of it. We tell you a soul apart. Yeah, I just, it, just, it had that supernatural kind of yeah. take to it, which I was really, like I said, I was never a, a really big like slasher movie fan. I just thought they were kind of campy, and I'm sure they had obviously they have their place in history, but uh, but that movie was I it might have been my favorite horror movie out of uh, out of the '80s. Uh, it's a fantastic movie, but it's definitely in my top three. It's like in my it's my number four. Was so, it? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. kind of an honorable mention. Yeah, just yeah, definitely. related to that movie in really well. Now, I'm, wait, wait. Uh, I, I guess I, I, I mean, I've seen it, obviously, but I don't remember. Did they ever cover the fact as to why he had pins all over his head? And had he, like the Cenobites, like they have like this, <sighs> this conflation of pain and pleasure. That's yeah. what, that's, that's what they do. So it's like they, they take you to the apex of pain right to and then it rolls like over into pleasure so like whatever you you come back like when you do come back you come back as this like horrifically mutilated masochist pretty much <laughs> yeah it's it's the it's the ex extreme s and m story basically. yeah i was gonna say, it kind of almost started <clears throat> a strange little side genre to these s and m almost kind of horror movies where it, it and obviously there was more than one more than one movie that came out of 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 that movie so the hellraiser uh, the series. hellraiser series yeah. there was a lot more than that but well, you like it like cell the or not the cell but cell yeah it's uh similar in that in that aspect yeah and at least in the original hellraiser like the first couple of movies what was cool about the Cenobites is yeah they killed you and whatnot but they didn't just like randomly go after you. Like you had to sort of summon them with the box. Right. Right. And there was a reason that you were almost calling them. Yep. In a sense, like they didn't just randomly walk around and search people. They had to be summoned and you yep. were the one that ultimately ended up summing them. So technically you were yep. kind of created your own demise. Yeah. The, in the second one, when the, uh, the doctor, tricks the mentally ill girl into opening the box for for him uh they're about to kill her but then pithead goes it is not had some of us it is desire yeah and so yeah that, that was a unique take on that 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 they like yeah they go after people who are like um hedonists uh-huh see i just remember i remember the one scene that stands out in the first one i think is with the fish hooks oh yeah when the, yeah you know, the guy just gets, he gets literally torn apart by, I don't know, hundreds, a couple hundred fish hooks, mm -hmm. and just torn about. to pieces, and it was just horrifying. It was completely uh, horrifying to watch that. And there's sometimes there are scenes in these movies uh, that are really hard to watch, and I think that mm. I recall that as being one of the scenes that I really had a hard time watching. Yeah, and it was kind of almost a... Uh it was almost like when some of the people were being tortured that there was this little almost snippet of enjoyment yes that they had in it at the same time mm -hmm. it wasn't like you were being chopped up by a knife and you know it was almost like they're like you said just brought them right to that point where pain and pleasure sort of mixed 
And in some instances, it like there were a few scenes in there where they were summoned on purpose because these people wanted to feel that. Yeah, exactly. Yep. It's pretty sick and twisted. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, it is in a sense. It's very, very, but it's, it's very much Clive Barker. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I was going to say too, because I, I've I've read almost every Clive Barker book, and, and oh nice, I think he's a, a incredible horror writer. Like, uh, so that that also helped it for me too, because I was very familiar with Clive Barker and his books. Um, you're, you're, so that that's great. That's great for me. Well, the tagline that's on the poster says "Demon to some, <laughs> angels to others." That's right. Exactly, that's exactly. And that's exactly it. It was a mixture of the pain to pleasure, and where that sort of overlapped right. to where they both became necessary. Like the pain and the pleasure, almost you couldn't tell the two apart. Mm. And so that was it. Was like I said, it was it was horror in a sense because people obviously died and got blown up and bloody and everything, but it was also very psychological. It is like how how far could you take yourself until you were you know where where that line of pain and pleasure sort of overlapped each other to the point where they were almost both necessary to live. That's pretty dark, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling a I'm That's calling safe dark. word here. Uh, you, you got a safe word? Is that what you said? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna call on my safe word here because I think we're getting a little too mad. L- l- a little too deep. <laughs> a little too deep in the rabbit hole there. Right. Uh, all right. Well, I think we should go on to Nick's third pick. Okay. Um. You know what? I was thinking about this. I was looking at all the different things, and then I noticed this one. And it's funny. I I don't think of this as an '80s horror movie just because of the aesthetic and you know the actors in it. But you know, it's true, and it's very much a horror movie. Uh, The Shining came out in eighty. You know, we always think. You know, I've mm-hmm. always thought about it as a very mm-hmm. simple horror movie because it's, it's got that the well, usually when there's a decade changeover, it doesn't really establish its own identity for a few years. Always very creepy. You know, one of the few universally agreed upon good Stephen King adaptions, though he would disagree. Yeah, apparently he really did not like how it turned out. Red Rum. Red Rum. <laughs> Red Rum. And, I mean, yeah, if you've ever, you know, read the original story or watched the unfortunate miniseries that was out in the 90s, it's uh, a very a very different, the characters are quite different from in the Cooper movie, but I think that works. Although, I will say, as awesome as he is, I never bought Jack Nicholson as anything but a total psychopath in that movie. It's supposed to be about his breakdown from a family man uh, who's trying to redeem himself into a, you know, acts crazy psychopath. But no, he was, he, to me, his dial was turned all the way to the left, the left from the beginning of that movie. Isn't that all, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy? Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. Yeah. He was not believable at the beginning of that movie as kind of the, you know, I'm, I'm here to kind of, you know, be a normal person. And yeah, he wasn't believable in that aspect at all. No, it's supposed to be like about his dege- like he was, you know, he was an alcoholic, and obviously that brought out his demons, and it was supposed to be about his degeneration. But no, and, you know, I love Jack, and I, I love him in that movie. But it, yeah, it just you even if you never know to think about the you know the story, you knew he was gonna snap but hard in that movie. <laughs> yeah, you know, and there's I- Johnny, and I love the idea of you know having a big empty hotel to like. You know, do a big wheel through. Up oh until yeah! Until I see this movie, and then it's like, well, forget that. <laughs> <laughs> so you see the creepy, yeah. the creepy twins, and the the person in the teddy bear costume, or even or the uh, the shower the, scene. The old yes. lady in the tub, yeah. The old yep. lady in the tub is that takes a cake for me right there. Yeah, I just always kind of assumed that that was just Jack Nicholson acting himself. Yeah, I don't, uh, yeah. <laughs> because you're right. Because the beginning of the movie with him anything but insane was almost thoroughly unbelievable like he just doesn't seem he doesn't fit that role in any fashion it was no. almost like that he was that didn't need to be that position like that guy as the character himself was yeah, ready Jack- to split apart at the seams anyway <laughs> exactly and you know and i'm just gonna clarify i think jack nelson is a fine diver- like versatile actor and i think he could play very many different roles but i think for a while he was definitely playing the kind of edgy, you know, stereotypical Jack Nicholson character that, you know, he, he got used to 
playing, and uh, Jack Torrance was a big part of that. Well, yeah. you know, that, that was right about the same time that uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's in this came yep. out. So, yep. I mean, yep. so, well, within a year or two of it. And uh, he kind of, I think he got pigeonholed into that role. Because mm-hmm. he oh. did it well. <laughs> I mean, he played a complete, you know, psycho yep. pretty he well. Was- yeah, he was more of a, he was more of like a generalized scumbag in Cuckoo's Nest, but yeah, it wasn't a question of if he would snap, but when. That was the <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the movie does kind of really it it still holds up too. Oh god, yeah. If you've seen it recently, I don't know if you've seen it in the, even the last ten years because it's been so long ago. But the movie still holds up, and I'm surprised because movies these days just it, it all they do is remake something or make something that's a comic book at this point mm-hmm. yeah. and surprised that that movie hasn't been attempted i, I well, can see it, i can see why they coming. wouldn't are you kidding me really no it's it's coming wait really because as i said they made a mini series for tv in the 90s which was extremely hit or miss but close to the book and they were they're actually remaking for a film now that's that's what i've that's what i've heard oh my god you know, i can't i can't I can't say I saw it in writing. I've just heard they are remaking it. Well, so anyone on Twitter I, I could be free to educate us. Who knows? <laughs> I, I, I want to know, but somebody yeah. could be completely talking out of turn and just blowing a lot of you know smoke. Yeah, I'm not really sure if I would want to see that. I don't think I would. Remade? I, I don't. I don't oh, know. Come on. Okay. How can you be like like Dave said? The big wheel scene. Big wheel <laughs> through the hotel. I mean, it was even, it was even, uh, I don't know if you call it a cameo, but it was in Twister. You know, yeah, when you're the, right, you're right, you're oh, right. When, when the Twister was going through the drive-in theater, that was the movie that was on. That, that was a scene, right. That was yep. uh, right there at the, uh, as he was going through with the big wheel, yeah. Right, the big wheel and the twins and everything. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something that I don't know if it could be reproduced properly, and it, no. even the, the miniseries showed that, really, that it can't be. No, it really well, be done. It was done. It was done well the first time. I know that stamp is all over it. Of course, I know uh, when we did this. When we did the Stephen King podcast, Lou said that you know through his connections or whatever that Stephen King really was not happy about his uh, uh, about this portrayal of his story. But I still, I still think it was very well done and very scary and just freaky. It just made you just kind of creeped you out the whole time. All right, well, here's a note. Hollywood people, you cannot redo Shining without Scatman Crothers. <laughs> Do not redo this movie without that man. Oh, dear, yeah. Oh, Don't even try. Dick. Don't even try. Might, it, it, might kind of, it might be funnier if it was Samuel L. Jackson, because he'll just yell at everybody. <laughs> oh, my God. If he, oh, if he was the... Oh, wow. If he was the Dick Halloran character, that would be awesome. <laughs> and I, you'd have to, you might have to replace the big wheel with like one of those two wheel razor things. That would be, yeah. A, a, if well, I, and they might not be, they might be out of style now too. So I don't know. Well, you think they'd modernize it so it'd be like a Segway or something? Or uh, yeah, I guess so. Or <laughs> those don't, little... don't give them ideas, people. Yeah. Come on, <laughs> look it up. And let's see any remake of the cards. Thank God, but nice. don't give them ideas. <laughs> I looked it up, and I looked, uh, uh, is there going to be uh, the Shining remake? And the only thing it referenced was that miniseries. And, uh, okay. Uh, so I don't I don't think yeah, there's don't, anything on don't. tap. I must have oh, heard don't. something incorrectly. It's okay. I, I'm, I don't mind at all, because I don't want it to be remade, personally. Do I? That's okay. Most, most people in the press make their living on things they think they heard. So you're fine. You could. Oh, you could, so I should apply for a job. In the you should be. You could be a reporter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought the same thing when they said they were going to remake RoboCop. I was like, oh no, they couldn't do that. And then there you go. If they did, I watched it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I am too. <laughs> <laughs> That's just. That was about an hour and fifty two minutes. I'll never get back. <laughs> uh, we almost need to do an eighties so podcast bad. about. The uh, the bad remix. We really oh we could. There you go. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. No, no, I mean it would just be an hour and a half of us grousing like a bunch of old men. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, yeah. so what else? What else is different? <laughs> get off! Get off my lawn! That's... Yeah, oh god, they're moving. <laughs> yeah, 
All right, so back on topic, I am actually on... I'm the only one that hasn't given a, a third pick. I've got the one that I want to give, and I feel bad because it's not Nightmare on Elm Street. And nobody wow. brought that up yet. That um, was too easy. I, of course we would have known Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> too easy. <laughs> but, you know, I, I've got to go with another one that just really freaked me out as a kid. Uh, and it's another Stephen King movie. Uh, this time, Cornfields. Oh, That's man. all I gotta say. Everybody already knows what oh, I'm talking okay. about. Children of the Corn. Children of the Corn. Oh. So Outlander. <laughs> Outlander. Exactly. You know, <laughs> you had a very not pretty Malachi, who is the young, oh, yeah. uh, you know, who is uh, one of the leaders of this, you know, the kids. Um, you know, and, you know, of course, you know, everybody remembers him yelling, Outlander, yep. you know, and, and, you know, that right there, you know, is creepy in itself. Then you've got this creature that is going underground that is kind of, you know, as soon as somebody's put up to be a sacrificial, you know, person, you know, they, you know, this creature from underneath the uh, the corn stalks or whatever is able to like you walk uh, behind the rose yeah right? exactly thank you <laughs> you walk behind the rose exactly yeah. but the thing that <laughs> freaked me out the most is the one where there's this kid named Isaac oh yeah oh yeah yeah Isaac. and um you know they he does something to you know burn the others and then they decide that he's not with them anymore so they sacrifice him to that mm-hmm. creature and yeah. then he comes back. Spoilers, by the way, guys, if you haven't seen it. Oh, my God. Come on. It's an A's movie if you haven't seen it yet. <laughs> you know, other than me and the thing. But anyway, um, you know, <laughs> so we're talking about Children of the Corn. And, you know, Isaac is sacrificed. And, you know, he then becomes possessed. And he comes back and he does this very creepy line where he's, at, you know, with Malachi. And he's like, he wants you to. He wants you to Malachi, and it was just kind of like, oh my god, that was just so powerful. And you know, as a kid, you know, it freaked me out in a good way. So I say nothing of the opening scene where the kids slaughter the entire town. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I'm jumping way forward into the movie, but you're right. There was so much of that movie that was just creepy and scary and uh, '80s goodness. <laughs> Well, it's like, <laughs> on paper is is so silly, so beyond just kind of <laughs> crazy kids, you know, in the cornfield. But no, when they actually put it into practice, it can, it's pretty creepy. I have tell you, you, have you ever? I'm driven going if I'm the, driven through if I'm driving through and there's a cornfield and there's like nothing else yeah. around. I Eat see up. a kid that looks like Isaac. Dude, I'm breaking all kinds of road laws. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm hitting the gas. <laughs> yeah, speed up, go through. Don't. Well, don't drive through uh, Western Pennsylvania because it, you drive through Mormon country and with the cornfields and all that stuff. You literally feel like you're driving through that movie at some point. <laughs> yeah, and that, I I, and I've, I've made that drive, and, and I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> it literally is like <laughs> children of the corn come to life. Well, and the fact that Isaac looked like a you know creepy just little looked Mennonite evil. demon. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it, he, well, he would just that, have to stand there, and he looked evil. He had the Amish hat going on. Yeah, yeah. That that flat brimmed hat. That was, exactly. And yeah, that actor exactly. was actually in his twenties, actually, too, at the time. Yeah, and yep. I don't know who did his makeup, but you know, with the dark circles under oh, his yeah. eyes, and yep. just he—he he was just a creepy little kid. At least they portrayed him as a creepy little kid. Yeah, it doesn't really go too deep into like. What made him look like how he got involved with that, did he? It's just one of those things it's like somehow he got, you know, entangled with this, you know, extra dimensional force and became, you know, just crazy psycho preacher kid. Now right. I I didn't read a lot of the books, but I know, you know, this is another Stephen King thing. And but there was a lot of, you know, a lot of children in the corn, five, six, seven, eighteen, uh and I think one of them actually goes back and kind of tells the story, like a, oh, kind of a prequel. I I could be wrong, but 
Well, at least in the in the film itself, it doesn't go. It doesn't go. No, in that in that original film, no, it doesn't. And I think they still. It was still a really creepy, creepy movie. Definitely, definitely falls into the horror category that we've been discussing all night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. And strangely, there seems to be something even extra scary about a scary kid. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like Gage from Pet right. Cemetery. Yes. Oh yeah. god. Yeah. <laughs> Creepy little Gage. <laughs> Zombie, yeah. Zombie Gage. Yeah, another, exactly. Another Stephen King reference here. Yeah, there you go. He did, I mean, he did I mean Stephen list. King, as far as horror movies, is like you said, you did a podcast. He's almost a category of his own, really. Yes. In the 80s, absolutely. Well, how many friggin' Stephen King movies came out in the 80s? It seemed like there was one coming out every six weeks. Uh, yeah. I believe there's 15 or 16. Yeah. It's... Something like that. I think that uh, podcast when, was just under two hours, so you do the math. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I'm not surprised. I mean, it, it because everything that he did. I mean, he even took little, you know, he took little small short stories like Trucks, and they made uh, Maximum, uh, uh, Maximum Overdrive. The, the only it. film he ever directed, and uh, the one he claims he honestly doesn't remember doing any of. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. don't get. Yeah, Firestarter, okay. Maximum Overdrive, Children of the Corn. Yeah, good Christine, stuff. Christine. Christine. We'll mention Running Man. Hey, hey, we'll always <laughs> mention Running Man. That's oh, that's you. right, Nick. Yeah, that was one of your picks. This is one of your favorites of 1987. That, that, that's, so, that's one of my House Fire movies. See? That if the house is on fire and that movie's on, I can wait a few minutes. <laughs> you, have to go, you have to go in this direction again. You know, how, you know We, we cannot do a podcast without bringing that reference up. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> the Running Man. Oh, the, there's, some, there's some Running Man animosity. I can, I can feel it in a room. Dude. You no, no, the uh, the house I'll fire theory. Later. So if uh, your house is on fire, and what movie would have to be on in order for you to stop and go, I've got a few minutes, I'll go ahead and just watch a few more scenes. The Burbs. <laughs> <laughs> Better off dead. Oh, oh well, damn. Uh, <sighs> so Nick, is it Running Man for you? Three, Running Man, Bill and Ted, and Goonies. <laughs> I can, I can, Bill I can, and uh, Ted. Yeah. Now wait. Bill and so Ted, two movies. The first movie. Okay. For Excellent Adventure, then. Excellent Adventure. Party right. on, dude. Forgiven. <laughs> forgiven. <laughs> you're, you're, you're forgiven. Well, yeah, Bogus Journey is kind of out there. It's it's fun, though. You gotta admit, them fighting death was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah speaking of right. a, speaking of 80s remakes, there's another one. Well, they're, they're making a third. They're ma- they want to make a third one. They're not making a remake. They want to make. Oh, it's not a remake. Now it's oh okay. They, they want to make a legitimate third Bill and Ted movie with Keanu and Alex Winter and. No. <laughs> Just <laughs> leave it alone, oh. guys. <laughs> oh my god! I don't need another one. <laughs> well, they've been saying it for years, so I don't know if it's actually going to happen or not. But no, when to say no? <laughs> yeah. I just it amazed how prolific Stephen King was in the eighties. It's oh, yeah. just, I mean, just looking at like IMDb, it's. I mean, I forgot all about Cujo and the Dead Zone and oh, yeah. Cat's right. Eye and uh, what do you say? Ubiquitous. Uh, yeah, or just there. Yep. Was, yeah. it, was um, it was obvious? <laughs> a misery, misery, yeah. Uh, <laughs> misery. Yeah. Was Pet Cemetery in the eighties? Was yes, it eighty yes. nine? Yeah, eighty nine. God. Unfortunately, Shawshank Redemption, which may have been his best movie adaptation or movie. Oh uh, my God! Stand 19. by me! Come on. Oh, okay. No, that's yeah, true. Stand that by was, me. That was eighty eight, eighty seven. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Then we're going into TV. It. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, so my my burning Sorry, house Matt. one for Matt is uh, Mac and me. Oh, there you go, Matt. All right, I gotta say, Dave, that was when Matt went off on his Mac and Me spiel. That was pretty funny stuff. Podcast (laughs) gold is what that was. Yeah, it's hard to replicate that. Yeah. (laughs) Know it, yeah. All right, so we do. I have... really, I really forgot that that movie was ever even made. <laughs> As I most to. people should. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, wait, wait. Whose debut was that? Oh, what? that was a uh, 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 Jennifer. Jennifer Aniston. 
Jennifer Aniston was one of the dancers in the yes. uh, end scene. Yes. It was her acting debut on yeah. the big screen. Yep. Well, it was, you'd only go up from there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, so we do have one Twitter shout out I want to really? throw out there. So it's at uh, J.R. Wells 82, who's a regular Twitter shout out for us, which is awesome. He brings up Child's Play, Critters, mm-hmm. Gremlins. Lots of great stuff from the decade. Psycho 2 is an underrated sequel. Oh, yeah, Psycho 2. So, and Gremlins. Yeah, Gremlins. gremlins. You know. do, do you classify Gremlins as a horror movie? Horror I, w- I think I would. You know, it falls into that category because we, we kind of had a, a pretty broad spectrum of uh, of horror movies. You know, you go from slasher to supernatural to, to creatures. I mean, you can even look, bring up Leprechaun, which is... <laughs> I don't know if that would, that might have been ninety. I think it was ninety, really ninety. Uh, anyway, well, but was it, stuff wasn't like it you, that, Nick? Or, uh, I think it was you, Nick, that mentioned that um, Gremlins was supposed to be dark originally. Yes, it was supposed to be much, it, much darker. Even though the little comedic touches that the first one had over the second, you know, second one was definitely more broad comedy, but the first one had its little comedic touches. But yeah, the Gremlins are supposed to be far more violent. I think yeah, it would have been more in the vein of like Critters, I guess. Well, Critters was, came after. Now, was Phoebe Cates still going to be in the, you know, darker one? Because that's all that might no, You know, you, I, you said it wrong. I think it's, you said it wrong. Fabulous Phoebe Cates. The fabulous Phoebe Cates. <laughs> you, you know, again, I'm just <laughs> I'm, speaking from, I'm speaking from a little bit of the movie tree I picked up here and there. It might have been at the script stage. They might have, um, you know, fixed it at the writing stage because um, I don't know when Joe Dante came on to do it, but he's always had that comedic edge to him, so. Uh, I did. I did kind of hear that too. That that was supposed to be like a much darker movie than it really kind of ended up being. Almost a little bit funny, you know. Oh, it's very funny. Yeah, with especially. I mean, the, the, with the with the creatures in the in the movie theater, you know, watching the movie oh, was just. Oh my god! Snow that was like the popcorn and all that stuff. That was just. I mean, that's that really is. That that is great comedy. Whoever Wait. wrote that scene into the movie to make it a little bit lighter. It was almost out of the Muppets. Yeah, it really sort was. of in a sense. Really. Yeah, it was very Muppet like. Like they say, okay, well, we need to lighten this up a little bit, or you know, we're not we're not going to have the younger kids coming to see the cute little animals turn into monsters. So let's let's add a little levity to this. So they well, must have been inspired by Jim Henson at some point. Well, Gremlins, movie. Gremlins, and um, the first Gremlins and. I think it was Raiders of the Lost Ark helped to inspire the PG-13 rating because, uh. yeah, parents would take their kids to this PG movie and it would be much, much darker than they expected. Yeah. So, yeah, they figured they needed a, a second, uh, like a little buffer zone. See, I don't know why this is a reoccurring theme with me, but Psycho 2, I seem to just, the only thing I remember about that is Jennifer Tilly. Oh, wow. Jennifer Tilly. Wow, I forgot about her. Yeah. She's stuck in your dreams, man. <laughs> I know. I know she is. What is this? But this, yeah, I'd remember her at being in that movie, Jennifer Tilly. I had a big crush on her. In also in Moving Violations. Jennifer or Meg Tilly? Uh, Jen- Meg Tilly. I'm sorry. Yeah. It was oh, Meg you're Tilly thinking Meg Tilly. Okay. Yeah, Meg Tilly. Yeah. Thinking Jennifer Tilly, her sister. Oh yeah. Well, the Tilly twins. Yeah. Meg Tilly, different Tilly. <laughs> yeah, different Tilly. A whole different type of Tilly. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note all right oh my so, God. this has been a great show guys yeah. <laughs> i'm really kind of disappointed that out of all of our picks there wasn't really a big discussion on nightmare on elm street well everyone knows that's scary again you wanted to broaden your horizons a little bit i mean i mean wasn't it scott what didn't you Weren't you like putting something on Twitter, or not Twitter, but Facebook around one, two, Freddy's coming for you? Yeah. Yeah, because you know what? I just watched one of the episodes. I think it was the second one. Or, oh, which one was it? I just had it on in the background. So. What was the plot? Which one? What's the plot? I think it was. I, it was not Dream Warriors, so it was oh. number two. Freddy's was, Revenge? Uh, when he tries to take over the kid there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he possesses the kid and. Like gets into his uh, into this kid's head. Yeah, he, the, like the, the only time they ever did that in the series is makes kind of the oddball of the series. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, the Dream Warriors was kind of weird too. I, that was, See, that, was ter- I, that was a terrible movie to me. That, I, that was just I and I was never really a big. Uh, I mean, I, obviously, I've seen the first, the Nightmare on Elm Street, but I, I guess just in my own personal view, it never really did anything for me because it was still kind of slasher. So I didn't. I just kind of eh, yeah, it's it's good movie, but I wouldn't. Uh, I mean, like I I liked Reanimator. It's like a movie that no one mentioned. I thought that was a good movie in the eighties yeah, too. I, that's more, that's a horror comedy too. I think. Yeah, a little bit. It is a little bit. Uh, well, okay. I, I want to tell you, Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> what freaked me out the most was not necessarily the movie, but when I was watching it, maybe for the first time, I was. At, I mean, it, was, it may have been like HBO or something like that, and my mom is in the room, and she's actually laughing at it. <laughs> <laughs> that freaked me out. I'm like, oh my god. So yeah. I, I don't know what it was, but it was like, why is my mom laughing at Freddy Krueger? <laughs> right. Well, the thing was, is like Jason and 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 uh, and Michael from Halloween, and you know, they still always became scary. Whereas Freddy Krueger had a little comedy in it, so you could sort of laugh at the same time that you were. I think that's what made it less scary. Yep. Was that it, it was almost a caricature, like he was. Almost like a scary, but sort of a buffoon. And that was, in, but that's the difference in the first one is that he only quipped very briefly in the first one. He right. wasn't really the quipster that he was in the later ones. Later in the movies, they played that up a yeah. lot and mm-hmm. made him more funny and more mainstream, as they weren't as just extremely like horror, horror, horror movie, like a slasher movie. They became a more of a, like you said, almost like a comedy, like a horror comedy, because. Mm-hmm. He ended up being, you know, within two or three movies, he became a caricature of himself. Well, and and, and that's gonna be some kind of record because I was like, was it six movies in seven years? Oh, they were pumping him out pretty yeah. good for a while. Yeah, you know, I can't help but think of of uh, the third one, Dream Warriors, without thinking of Dawkins' theme song. Oh yeah, <laughs> we're the Dream Warriors. Bad. If you ever wanted to get a sense of what the '80s was, yeah, yeah. horror would... movies got power ballads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now, does anyone remember the poem? That oh yeah, one, two, Freddy's two, coming, Freddy's for, coming you. for you. Oh. Three, four, better lock your door. Five, six, grab your crucifix. Seven, eight, That's... stay up late. Mm-hmm. Nine, ten, never sleep again. Yeah, yeah go Nick. Yeah. Nice. That's oh. impressive. Oh, well, thank you. I thought everyone knew that. <laughs> Is it just me? I just <laughs> Googled Tell it. Me. Not Tell just me you. I'm normal. That's what I started. <laughs> I started a couple weeks ago. I, I put out one, two, Freddy's coming for you. So. I need proof that that's not tattooed on your forearm. Oh. You just read it, like, <laughs> tattooed on it. <laughs> Tell me I'm normal, please. <laughs> Bad enough when I, when I did pub trivia one time. Like my group yeah. cleared up on the serial killer category. <laughs> yeah, there was. I had written down. I wrote down a couple of notes, and there was one. I don't. It won't get a lot of big talk, I'm sure. But uh, there was one movie that I remember. I've seen it a couple times. It was really good, but it was very stark, no frills, and it was uh, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Yes. Okay. There you go. Now that movie was, was that like the 80s. 85 or 86, I really? think. Yeah. Really? I yeah. Really in that. I thought yeah Henry famous. Portrait of a Serial wow. Killer. I'm going to look it up here real quick. Yeah, 1986. Was it was the, oh, it was the debut of Michael Rooker. That oh, no his, kidding. Launched his career. Ooh. Yeah. I, that was a great movie. But it was very no frills. I mean, it was very much like, I mean, there was no... <laughs> Portrait of a serial killer. Yeah, it it was that. It was just that. I mean, it was horror at horror. It was based on, I think, a real life serial killer too. At that it point, actually was. Yeah. It was, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember who it was. Oh, Henry Lee Lucas. Oh yeah. I'm looking it up now. Real life convict. Yeah, it's a pretty dark movie. Tomorrow. It is. It was kind of a, a but I just remember that movie is like a, I I I've seen that movie a couple of times. I think that really scared me that was the uh, pre like post uh post actually post ted bundy kind of that kind of whole horror kind of thing where all of a sudden they were making a ton of serial killer movies like 
Well, I'm going to go and, you know, just sort of look at myself safe? in the mirror. And, well, yeah. you know, I was, I, I, I wanted to bring up probably another throw out to one of our older podcasts because I just thought it was funny um, <laughs> where um, we were talking 1987 movies. And uh, at that time, we had uh, Nick and uh, Jesse on and Scott. And I whipped out, you know, talking about 1987 movies, I, I whipped out some kind of wonderful. And I talked about Secret of My Success. And then at the end of it, I whip out Angel Heart. Yep. Oh, yeah. And Angel Heart, for some reason, was, you know, it, 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 it stuck with me for so much because probably Lisa Bonet. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 But uh, that was a good horror movie from the 80s. Yep. Okay, I'm, I got to throw out an honorable mention here. And I have a story, a little story behind it. One of my best friends, this guy Joe, you know, when I came back to Chicago every year from California, I would come and stay at his house or come and stay at my grandma's house. But we'd stay, spend the night over at his house. His older brother brought this movie home one night on VHS. Actually, he brought two movies. He brought... Jimi Hendrix story, you know, his, like, the documentary about him. And he also brought Faces of Death. Oh, Oh, my God. (laughs) Jeez. Now, we've been talking about, like, movies that are, you know, acting and directed. This was just, like, so bizarre. And everybody said it was real life, you know, real, like a snuff film almost. I don't know if it actually was. I heard that it was urban myth that it really was a snuff film that most of these deaths were fake and filmed that way but that's got to be one of my uh, honorable mentions for horror movies <laughs> it was just freaky uh, that might have been like 80 or 81 it was very early on I don't even know yep. uh, but that one that one completely freaked me out because it seemed so real all right. Well, faces, so, of, faces of death was seventy eight. Seventy eight. Wow. So you, uh, yeah, we'll we'll have okay. to start. Uh, okay. You know, seventies groovy overdrive. I no, I I have to say I didn't witness it or experience it until the eighties. So that's my disclaimer. <laughs> is that Wait, is that acceptable? Faces of death wasn't real. I don't know, man. <laughs> no, I don't think it was real. No, I don't think it was either. It sure seemed like real when you were like... It sure seemed like real when I first watched it. 11 or 12 years old, you're going, oh my god, that's real. I yeah, am well, D- not... I- IMDB puts it as a documentary. Oh, I don't know what that tells okay. you. And it also puts it in 1978. I apologize. My my bad. Yeah, what are I'm you talking of... about a 78 movie on 80s Reboot Overdrive? Come on, man. Well, you know... <laughs> we expect really... our co-hosts to have a little more research. Come... It's It's... It's unfortunate because we couldn't really bring up movies like Friday the Thir- Well, Friday the Thirteenth was nineteen eighty. Eighty. That was. But 80. like Halloween, the no. original Halloween, can't. Jamie Lee Curtis was nineteen seventy eight or seventy nine. Yeah, seventy eight. So can't even like we can't even talk about that. And it's one of the iconic, yeah. scary films of our youth. You know, missed it by two years, yeah. Scott. All right, all right. All right. Scott, That's so Saturday detention for you. The question is, which archetype are you from the Breakfast Club? I'm going to have to be Bender this week. <laughs> okay. Good enough. <laughs> yeah, do your essay. No. I mean, we could bring up Halloween 3, but that that's a very much acquired taste. That was the one no, that tried that's... to take away from the formula. Yeah, that, that was no, there was no Michael Myers. In there. Was Halloween 3 the one with the, with the, with the, the season, masks? Yeah, yeah, Season of the Witch. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right. Shamrock and the, the, the song. Yep. Yep. Jeez, that was a terrible movie. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I think it would have been better if they actually stuck to their guns and made it an anthology series like they were going to, but then they made a sequel to Halloween, the first Halloween, and then it became associated with Michael Myers. Because yeah. that's what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be a Hall- like an anthology of horror films based on Halloween, and um, that was their attempt to get it back on track, and it didn't do so well, so... And they went back. They went back to Michael Myers and Jamie Lee Curtis. Mm-hmm. So it would have been kind of like the older version of American Horror Story. Really, it really would have actually. Yeah, that'd, yeah, that'd have been cool. Or a full-length creep show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in my attempt to wrap things up. Yeah. Right. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> um, let's get some parting thoughts. Um, what? Scott, what do you got for us? Oh, this was a lot of fun. I'm so glad we were able to do this before Halloween. I'm hoping 
you know, we're looking at a, a buck fifty five right now. Um, so it's it's been a great great show. We had a lot of good discussion, and Very much so. what what better time of year than right around Halloween to, to talk about all these movies? Because you know everybody's watching them. Oh yeah, so that's that's a that's all I got, man. All right, so Nick, what do you got? Same. I mean, this is um, this is my favorite holiday of the year. I. I will admit that I've been a little busy this year, and I haven't really had time to get a costume together, but I'll try to at least keep in the spirit of things and try to throw something something together. But this was awesome. I always love talking about horror movies and uh, scary stuff. And, yeah, this was a great time. And, ha- anyway, and happy Halloween, everyone. I'm curious now. I mean, I don't dress up, but do you guys do? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm kind of sometimes... You know, every few year, every couple of years, we do like we, oh, you know, Chris and Cheryl. Yeah. They, right? they used to have Halloween parties all the time, and we used to go every year. And so every year, we would actually come up with new costumes. And so, uh, but the last couple of years, we really haven't been to too many costume yeah. parties or Halloween parties. <clears throat> I think my wife and I went to one about five years ago when we went as uh, a redneck couple. Yeah. <laughs> so that was like you know that was that was kind of, but I think that was the last time I think it was about five years ago I don't think I haven't dressed I mean this Halloween I'll be at a hockey game on Halloween so and Jason Voorhees wore a hockey mask so there's some irony yes. there are you going to wear a hockey mask? <laughs> I probably should right an old style hockey mask but you need to find and you need to find like a plastic machete or something that you can bring with you that way at least you oh, I think these days I'll be I'll be alerted to Homeland Security and probably <laughs> arrested or something like that but no it was really great to be involved in the in the podcast I do I love horror movies I uh, and I love the 80s because I'm a, a you know, a teenage teenager in the '80s, so that was all my formative years, which explains a lot about how why how messed up I am. But <laughs> the, uh, uh, yeah, I was, real, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was great to be great to be involved. This is my second podcast with with heavy metal and horror movies, which sometimes, like you said, heavy metal crossed over into both of those. So uh, there's certainly some some familiarity with both. But yeah, I thank you guys. It was a very enjoyable, great discussion, great. Great bunch of guys. I would love to do it again soon. Definitely. Yeah, definitely a lot of fun. Um, you guys, yeah, great discussion. But I want to put paint a little image with you. You know, close your eyes and think about this. You're driving through a cornfield. And then all of a sudden, there is the clown from Poltergeist. <laughs> think about oh. that as you go to sleep tonight, kids. <laughs> As you're listening I to accelerate. our podcast, <laughs> yeah, accelerate. Happy exactly. Halloween! <laughs> Happy Halloween, everybody! Good night, Good night. There, whatever you are. <laughs> <laughs> we'll tell your soul to pieces. <laughs> you know, actually, we didn't do. Uh, do you guys want to throw out your uh, Twitter handles real quick? Oh, I'm at Scott's Eye. On Twitter or uh, Scott Compton Photography on Facebook. All right, Nick. All right, I am at Wheel I Am Crow. It's all one word. At at Twitter. So. And Chris. And on Twitter, I am uh, at Christopher's Zen. Cool. And uh, I'm Dave. I handle the '80s Reboot account, so it's at '80s Reboot on Twitter. Um, so thank you for listening. We live in the '80s, and we hope in some way we creeped you out tonight. <laughs> Uh, so uh, happy Halloween <laughs> good night <laughs> good night we hope you've enjoyed this show this podcast is part of the 80's Reboot Overdrive channel on Southgate Media Group you can follow us on Facebook on the 80's Reboot group page we're also on Twitter and Tumblr at 80's Reboot we invite you to check out all the wonderful podcasts and blogs available at southgatemediagroup.com and thank you for reliving the 80's <laughs>